Welcome to week 12. Welcome to the last week of semester. And I assume it's all getting a bit pear-shaped at your side of the equation. So let's make this quick. A couple of things to cover. Talking about the future, talking about the past. E-marketing in review, a couple of the areas that we didn't engage with directly and reasons why. So top of the list of things we didn't cover in this course, a deliberate search engine optimization strategy. First of all, any half-decent search engine optimization strategy has a very short half-life for two reasons. If you are promoting a search engine optimization strategy, the people running the search engines will be looking for it. If you are gaming their system, they will buy a copy of your gaming instruction manual and they will fix the loopholes you were using. Second reason is that the organic basis upon which search engine optimization is founded is making your site useful in a way that it suits the customers of the search engine. Now, SEO as a dark art is about making your site useful in a way that suits the algorithm of the search engine. But the search engine operators know that if they're constantly spitting out data that's of no value to the end user, but is very valuable to their computer, the end user is going to go away. So what we did instead, we focused on market segmentation, on the marketing mix, authentic content, and targeting to a an audience that you understood well enough to create something useful. So basically, what you're looking at is, if you want to, in the future, start doing the minor modifications around search engine optimization that might exist, there are a bunch of different ways in which you can Google that up, but you want to be looking for things that are less than one to two months old. You don't want to be buying something from 2011 talking about search engine optimization, nor really do you want to be buying something from January. Any half decent search engine and all the bad ones will be updating their protocols to respond to SEO strategy. It's Cold War. Second thing we didn't talk about is we didn't say the word funnels. We didn't say the words lists because a funnel basically is the AIDA model. There is a funnel on the screen, awareness to consideration, to conversion, to loyalty, to advocacy. Awareness, interest, desire, action. That's it. Someone took the ADA model and rebranded it. What it is used to do is that if you have signed up to something that's using a funnel is they'll make you an initial offer. Maybe it's a free PDF. Maybe it's a low cost book. Maybe it's a uh, social media guide. And you'll get your initial thing. So you, you spend your $7.99 and you buy your search engine optimization PDF. You download it. And as part of that, you give them your email address. And then for the next week, you'll get emails saying, Hey, friend, I see you bought our book. What about doing our course? What about doing our more expensive course? What about doing a more, more expensive, more course? And if you're like me, you'll be irritated very quickly. You bought the product, shut up and go away. Uh, for some people, again, for a mark, but for the whale, getting that all oh, insider knowledge, all oh, special knowledge, all oh, out group, in group, playing to those fears is what you need for, for conversion loyalty. You can do it if you want to do it. It's a sales tactic. There's enough stuff out there on it. I don't need to tell you about it. But what I do need you to do is I need you to have thought through the value offer. So the reason we didn't go on to the sales pitch is that this course was about the creation of an offering that has value, about you exploring what it was to create, communicate, deliver, and exchange something that you believe would be valued by an audience that you wanted to target. Get the hang of that, and it's a much more transferable skill than a six-step cold call email path. Because at the end of the day, you can have all the templates in the world you want for SEO and all the templates in the world you want for a cold call funnel. But you've got to have something people want to buy at the end of it. And you've got to have a, you've got to have the product first. And we are a product value offer first. And that's how we do it. As that's our marketing protocol. Value offer first, then you promote. 
Oh yeah, I talked about NFTs all the way through this course. I just wanted to say, um, as a con artist, fully respect the con, love the work. The people who came up with the first round of the Bored Apes ripped off the artist who generated, who created the art that is used for generating the Bored Apes. So the whole premise of the project of pay the artist, pay the artist fairly, is based on an outright lie. They screwed their original contracted graphics designer. So it began with the karmic, uh, or basically it began by running their karma over their foot. Uh, from there, it's basically a mildly interesting update on pyramid schemes. There are some various here. There's some Ponzi schemes. There's some multi-level marketing schemes, there's some Tupperware schemes. Basically, the premise of Bitcoin and the premise of NFT is that you buy an object which you then sell for a higher price because someone else wants to pay you more money for it than you bought it for. There is no actual way to make the object more valuable. So that's one of the things that's kind of interesting. Uh, if you're looking at something like an antiques collector's market, the reason why things become appreciably more valuable is the condition they are in, the number of, of items of their like in the marketplace, and the passage of time destroying the competitor objects. So a Picasso is worth something because there aren't that many Picassos. And when some joker goes out there, buys one and puts it through a shredder in the name of performance art, all the other Picassos go up because there's one less Picasso. That is why scarcity-based economics works in a scarcity-based, atoms-driven world. If you try and bring scarcity into an electron-driven, data-driven, infinite replicability world, then you're a con artist. Good on you. But you sure as shooting ain't creating anything of value. What you are using, though, is you are using a dark pattern. You are using the fear of missing out, which drove a lot of early adopters into this, who then suddenly realized that, oh my god, I have sunk money into a JPEG of a not particularly interesting art style. And really, it's not very interesting. But my FOMO caused me to spend money. Now I need to convince other people that they are missing out if they don't buy the thing off me. It is the worst game of hot potato I played with the most expensive odds, but it's done with price signaling, it's done with community in group out group, it's done with fear of missing out, and sometimes it's done with branding. The whole board apes uh, was a big push to create a prestige brand that by demand of, oh, I might, I could be an insider on a big money maker scheme, created the demand needed to validate the artificial scarcity. And uh, I didn't pay for that NFT. <laughs> I copied and pasted it from an article on Forbes. Because that's the final thing is if it can be displayed, it can be copied. And the whole premise of the NFT is that you are supposed to own the original master one take copy. Uh, they cannot create the value proposition that they are promising. You cannot have something that can be displayed digitally be uncopyable. Because in order to display it, it needs to go from the master that resides. Say you have a master copy, it resides on your hard drive. For me to be able to see it, my machine takes a temporary copy of it. Whilst it's on the temporary possession of my machine, I can create a copy of it. That's what digital duplication is about. That is why we have a lack of scarcity in data. When you display it, well, you don't display the original, you display a copy. And if your entire protocol is based on the idea of owning a master copy of something that is replicable and frequently displayed, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yep, it's a con. Follow the show. It's a very good con. I appreciate it as a con artist. It is a beautiful piece of artistry. God awful art, but magnificent con. All right, let's talk about the future. That was the past, now the future. XKCD. Um, one of the very early ideas we introduced here was the idea of novelty and how something can be new to you, but not new to the world. Uh, 
Also, in this, uh, I don't have the other XKCD I should have in here, which is if you encounter someone who hasn't met an idea that you know about, something that's old to you but new to them, encourage their sense of wonder. Let them explore the idea. Don't hold, don't go, oh, you don't know the thing. Huh, sniff. Don't outgroup them. Bring them in and say, hey, you haven't heard about the, the Mentos and Coca-Cola thing? All right, we're hitting the grocery store and the park. You're going to love this. It is greater and more value because value doesn't need to be based on scarcity in order to create value. If someone knows something new and so you get to teach someone else something new, you have created two rounds of value. They've gained a thing, you've gained a thing. So let's talk about prediction and predictive measures. Uh, first old school technique is there is an association of professional futurists. If you want to become a futurist, I'm, I've really got to get into this. Uh, I do like it as an idea, but I'm just terrible at doing it in practice. Uh, it just, I think it's magnificent that there is an entire genre of work that is about sitting around the place, speculating wildly, and then finding out in 10 years whether you were mostly remotely or not even once, right? Nate Silver, uh, 538 got it right once and from there well hasn't got it right since so the broken clock factor has done its thing but futurism if you can get it uh faith popcorn was one of the best futurists uh but there hasn't been as met there hasn't been a pop culture futurist as big as faith popcorn and the popcorn report it's entirely because i think the popcorn report was the coolest name ever back in the day the second way of doing the future is to go old school with the GE modify the modified GE finance matrix, uh, where you think about your capacity against your opportunity and say, what do you want to do? For those of you doing the power play, hey, say hello to a friend. For those of you not doing the power play, say hello to a friend anyway. Just greet them on the street. Hey, friend. But specifically, talk, look at this, talk yourself through it. Opportunity versus capacity because you cannot necessarily change the opportunity, but you can change the capacity. And one of the ways to modify the future is to look at the future you want, roll up the sleeves and say, right, let's go. What are the upgrades I need and the steps I need to take to be able to capture the future I want? And by the mere fact that you have done this course says that you went, I have identified a capacity I want to enhance because I see an opportunity I want to pursue. Now you can look at this, you can take the GE finance matrix, and look at your semester and go, where am I at going forward from here? Is there a market opportunity to be an e-marketer? Do I have a slow, medium or high strength in the area? The third way of doing it is fortune telling. Uh, I go my old school Terry Pratchett. <sighs> Terry Pratchett understood many things, and I do like the Granny Weatherwax. Uh, there's a number of things around the Granny Weatherwax principles that I adhere to. Uh, one of them is the Weatherwax principle of to be the best, you have to be the best. You don't get a choice. That when someone comes to you with a challenge, if you are the best, you must meet that challenge. If you decline the challenge, you are no longer the best. You don't have to necessarily succeed in the challenge is one my view. I may differ from Pratchett in that respect, but you always, if you are going to claim to be the best, then that is a burden that you take up. It is not something you do lightly. Equally, fortune telling. I always love this idea of uh, good fortune telling and fortune tellers is it should be done by people with no talent. Uh, this is why there is the guide to cold reading. If you want to do a cold reading of a fortune, uh, this is a con technique. And what you do is that you're basically using social psychology, you are using banter and social engagement. Your client has come to you to talk and they need a listening ear. And if you have the right mix of charisma and training, and you have a welcoming personality, you can do a cold fortune reading with a set of screwdrivers. You don't need anything. You can do it with a bowl of fruit. Uh, 
in Equal Rights, a good gumbo was recommended. I can tell you now that there is nothing quite like pulling the future out from the process of making a fried rice. The idea is Cold Read reads the person and gives the person the opportunity to talk. People like to talk included. Uh, so the more you let them talk and tell you and you find out what the problem that they want to solve by coming to a fortune teller is and then you can start whatever you're using as your props to enable them to hear the message they want to hear. On the other side of the equation is when you go and do it without asking and you do it without the cold reading. Uh, the tarot reading was done at the start of semester uh, before, it's kind of interesting, we actually crashed uh, the Queen of Cups, I believe it was. It took me three goes to get that to generate. Uh, we crashed on multiple times, so there were futures that were indeterminate about this subject. But the full tarot reading is listed up on the website. Uh, how accurate was it to the semester? How was it for you, mates? Because that was done and there's no interpretation provided it's just look at what there did it fit your experience of the semester so having talked about the couple of old school things i want to talk about a couple of predictions i have i'm going to play my futurist role thank you new south wales at the time of filming new south wales was flooded at time of recording uh we were on our third or fourth major once in a hundred year floods for the year. So this is like the dead simplest thing I can see. We are going to start having internet crisis and digital outages that are weather event related. Uh, ANU in one year, the year uh, Cambria was being constructed and the ANU campus flooded after a freak storm dropped basically a month's worth of rain in half an hour and it was a really good storm because I was walking to work during the, for the entire duration of that storm uh, I've been in cyclones and I have not been as wet as I was in that storm so it was a good storm it flooded the basement of the library which kept all the archives and the servers and it knocked out the power supplies of a number of buildings a few days after um, the campus had recovered, the power supply to ANU CB26 and the, uh, uh, it was just ANU CB26 was knocked out again. The problem was we kept all the servers for the, A for the CBE, College of Business and Economics, entire email server and Wattle server were were kept in the one building and it was kept in that building because it had the best of the power supplies and was kept at the top floor of that building because it was the least likely to flood not only did the building flood but the power box flooded and it blew the fuse on the entire network we were unable to contact anyone to tell them that classes were cancelled because we couldn't get the student lists off the server because we couldn't get to the mail server and we couldn't get to the wattle server after that, a few more redundancies were introduced. But the other problem we encounter is that people will start looking at backup systems and go, well, we haven't used that redundant system, so we shouldn't pay the money for it because we don't use it. And then we don't have the redundancies. We don't have the fallback positions. And this is my prediction, is that we're going to see a couple of major weather events in the near future, in the next five years, that come with massive internet outages where we lose a cable, uh, a critical cable between Sydney and Melbourne, between Brisbane and Canberra. We have a major digital outage because of a weather-based thing, whether it's a, the solar panel farm on the roof gets cleaned out by an ice storm, uh, the third freak ice storm in Canberra since I've been there, or whether the servers that are kept in the basement get flooded, or whether the um, diesel generators that we keep on the roof get flooded because the roof collapsed under the ice storm. One of those is going to happen. We're going to have a major internet outage brought on by weather. Second prediction. 
work from home and the disintermediation of society continues. There's a lot of backwards and forwards. Uh, there's a massive spike in angry HR and angry chief finance officers and angry chief operating officers wanting everyone back in the command and control structure. Equally, there's a bunch of people going, hang on, command and control gave us less return than decentralized is giving us. So you're going to have the battle between one arm of the company wanting everyone back in the office because they're paying money for the office and God damn it, we're going to use it. And another arm from the shareholders and profit side going, wait, we're doing better with decentralization. Maybe we should get rid of the office. But the taste of decentralization and disintermediation is going to flow on into other aspects of community. If we start an increased level of work from home, study from home, then we're going to have less reason to build a hub and spoke model where everything is centralized and everybody comes to the city for eight hours a day, consumes uh, lunch in the one three hour window with you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people going for lunch between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. to local localizations, to returning to the community, the village, the decentralized, uh, my, many, many more hubs in a spider web pattern than one central core, which will in turn impact on people's desire to have Facebook. Hear me out. Facebook was a very good centralization hub. Facebook's strength and its relative advantage at the outset is that it gave us a common clearing ground. When it was easy for us to share links and it was easy for us to post content that was then seen by the people who we wanted to follow, it worked really well as a centralized clearing hub. As Facebook increased in power, strength and everything else, it started to modify our access to our own information. It restricted who's, which of our friends we could see in the network. So it broke its strength in centralization. Now at the moment, we haven't really had any demand to decentralize, but I feel that the whole notion of decentralization will lead to digital disintermediation. We won't want a central Facebook as much as we will want a local community connection. And if we can run, if we're setting up, if the return of the corner store, if the return of the local cafe is a social hub, then it won't be too hard to go old school and chuck a server under the counter besides, you know, you've got the coffee machine, you've got the uh, takeaway window, and you've got the server that runs the local community website, which has a local community chat for it. And you think about our little pocket experience that we have here in the subject, replicate that across thousand postcodes, then disintermediation is going to drive and that's going to be, we're going to be less interested in aggregates and big centralized and Facebook is big centralized tech. Uh, the other thing about futures, if someone says this, I love the XKCD timeline. Uh, I keep saying five years. Um, the reason I say five years is it takes approximately two years to fail and three years to succeed. So if you're going to make it, then the first move a disadvantage will kill off the first attempt, but the second attempt will live long enough to get enough funding for the third attempt to sweep the market. Five years. Uh, two year, failure, three year, by year three, there will be something succeeding enough that whatever started at the failure of the first will come through and clean out the rest. Uh, I do love the also the idea of I'm not really looking at market applications right now. We can't afford to make two of them. We've made one. We cannot afford to make two of them. And I've been there. Uh, I've been there. That you just... What it took to make the first version of it is not something you can replicate and the luck or the rare parts or the rare components or the, hey, this works. Oh, damn, there wasn't a big enough market. This product is no longer available. Um, we've done this a lot with software. There has been a solution that's gone away because by the time the next 
the three generations down the line who went, hey, we could solve a problem with this. The original provider has gone broke. Uh, this was a big problem actually with iPhones and one of the um, iPhone iterations had to radically change the screens that they were using because the manufacturer that they'd been relying on couldn't get the parts because there was a there was sufficient demand for uh, capacitive touchscreens that it actually wiped out it nearly wiped the iPhone out after they created this huge demand for touchscreen technology that their manufacturer couldn't meet the demand because the solution they were using wasn't actually that scalable. Uh, a couple of places where I don't know what's going to happen next, but I do think it's going to happen. Uh, again, I talked about this, the hyperlocal, the walled gardens, which are the way you describe Facebook. There's the open internet and the walled garden of Facebook where you need a login in order to activate it and work with it. Facebook's got and put a lot of effort into being a monopoly provider of centralization. But it's taken away our ability to curate our own feeds and to see things in linear order, to see things with urgency. And the first platform that allows local, hyper-local, real-time, curated feeds, that as a hub will find a relative advantage. And I believe that the disasters are going to drive this. When I cannot get an update from Facebook that is relevant, and I get a message, a weather warning from my local weather, you know, the Queensland government puts out a weather warning and I get it three days after, because Facebook didn't think it was important to send into my feed in real time, relative advantage is broken. Something that can do real time. And this is where I think Twitter's gonna come back um, and either destroy itself by going to nonlinear timeline or kill Facebook by aggressively providing real-time linear timeline, show me what I have chosen to follow, show me my curated followers. That is the value proposition people need in an emergency. And we're gonna have enough crisis climate emergencies to make Facebook vulnerable because they're not showing you the content that you want to see, they are losing their relative advantage. Uh, the other places, there's some real problems coming up on um, the 24-7 always monitoring. Uh, I call this the clockwork stalkers. I've seen this a lot. People using machine-based algorithms to go into old timelines. So I've been on Twitter since 2008, I think. I've got a double figure history there. I've got a lot of stuff in my timeline and I don't remember all of it. But what I've seen happen is a comment, a throwaway comment that was made, you know, single tweet in 2017, being dredged up by a data mining, strip mining operation that is looking for certain keywords to then lodge complaints about these ancient tweets and use that as grounds to get contemporary accounts canceled. And this is the clockwork stalker. This is strip mining the past, looking for something that can be used as a wedge or a leverage against the future. We're gonna see this more and more when, as generations who have grown up with the internet, self-included, move into positions of authority where the news media or the gatekeeper organizations want to go back into your old past and will strip mine your past looking for something to go and hold against you in the future. And sometimes, a lot of it's gonna be photo based. A lot of it's going to be holding photos that were shared consensually amongst friends, but archived to iTunes, archived to uh, iCloud or Dropbox or OneDrive, because that's what you do, you don't think about it. Those archives being dredged up and basically toxic data wastes being trawled through to find something to use to blackmail a future. Uh, so something you did when you were 21, which was socially acceptable at 21, when you are 58 and running for office as the local member, suddenly having that ancient piece of data presented to you with a, well, wouldn't it be bad if this came to light? That is, we need to learn to forget. Data needs to be able to go away. There should, whilst we have the capacity to infinitely archive and resource everything and make everything on the permanent record, 
history was better suited by forgetting them. And this is where the ghost of the search will pass, using the attack patterns on social media archives, attack level archaeology, but also real-time interception. The current problem, and I cannot stress this enough, is that this little bastard's strengths are its absolute privacy nightmare weakness. That every photo I've taken has a GPS signal embedded in it, unless I actively scrape that information out, means that if I take this device into a sensitive location, like a protest, like a, uh, you know, a weather event, uh, if I'm taking photos inside a weather event and I upload these, can my insurance company go through and then cancel my insurance because they deemed me to have been in an at-risk behavior by being present in a weather event? Like, I'm out on the street taking photos, archiving and documenting the real-time crisis. You know, Canberra fires. Got GPS tagged footage and timestamp footage from the Canberra fires, could my insurance company go and then say, well, hang on, no, you, your behavior was at risk. Um, we won't, in, we're not going to continue to insure you for damage against fire or damage against loss because of fire unless you pay an absolute premium because we've looked at you real time. We've looked at your data and you're in that risk. Uh, equally, police interception of real time data and hostile, hostile use of real time data. So metadata has its strengths, but metadata can be misused horribly. And I do not, and there's a balance of probabilities things as well. Uh, a pregnancy fertility tracking application has a massive value to a person who can become pregnant, who wants to use that, who wants that knowledge, who wants to track their fertility. That it can be subpoenaed is the problem. The problem is the legal system. The problem is the justice system. The problem is a law that makes safe abortion illegal and a law that criminalizes pregnancy because it treats all unborn as potential crime. That is the problem. It is enabled as a worse problem because we have a technology that can enable misuse and misuse of law and misuse of technology. So we need to solve those. Those are social problems. Those are big tier things. But in the interim, we need to look at our data and go, do I need it? Do I need to retain it? Do I need to collect it? And what is a potential hostile attack that can be based on it that I should prevent? I shouldn't collect data that I don't need to collect. I don't need to ask for things that I don't, and I shouldn't store things that I don't need. Equally, we're up on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. I don't believe artificial intelligence exists at this point in time. I believe that we have some very aggressive AI adjacent spreadsheets, but we have a whole bunch of humans. Humans refusing to take responsibility for their creations because they have found a legal loophole and gone, oh, the computer did it. It's the dog ate my homework of social change. Blaming an algorithm should be immediately financial legal liability. If you go, oh, you know, it's not my fault the algorithm made the decision, but congratulations, you have just said you are at risk and you are responsible because you didn't keep your software under control. Uh, the other, like there are a lot of problems in machine learning and I've been on the periphery of machine learning based research because one of my colleagues started this in 98, 99. That's when they were looking, they got themselves uh, a quite powerful at the time computing cluster and were doing machine learning. And the thing was, is that they were training a solution set. And I'm sure it's gotten better than this over time. But basically what they were doing is that they weren't, they were showing the problem and they're showing the solution they were getting the machine to map pathways and i was like can it actually find its own solution no it can't because it needs the the end solution uh, where the idea was is that once you showed it the sorts of pathways is that that neuro neural pathway was supposed to then be given a new problem and it will find a new solution what we're finding is that the algorithm is and the ai and the machine learning are basically lazy uh, because the code is lazy. 
if you have an apple with the word banana written on the side of it, the machine will go text. Humans are usually reliable on text. I will code by text. And it will code that apple as a banana because it assumes that we won't lie. Uh, the coding, the machine learning that we use enables us to make horrendous mistakes at a much bigger scale. And the data washing of low quality data sets is incredibly risky. If we load up racist crime statistics, crime statistics that were created by racial profiling, by racist actions under a racist system, and I'm saying intentionally racist system that said, we want to discriminate against a portion of the population. And if you're going to go, oh, that sort of thing doesn't exist, South Africa apartheid. The data set that was created under the apartheid laws that criminalized ordinary behavior and data sets that are created under apartheid laws anywhere criminalize ordinary behavior for a specific portion of the population that are actively legally discriminated against because that's the point of apartheid. You take that data set and you stick it through an AI system and a machine learning system, it's still junk data. It starts as junk data, racist junk data, it ends as racist junk data, then you start trying to push all of that into AI curated data sets and keep data washing it, it's still junk. When you go and create a database of facial recognition software based entirely on pulling down the most popular pretty people in society, you're gonna have an absolute bucket load of white people if you are trolling through Who Weekly's photo library. Come on, it's a freaking niche market. We know as marketers that in market segmentation, we run the risk of creating stereotypes. At least we acknowledge that we have that risk. AI and machine learning, a lot of the databases are stereotype driven because it's easier to code a stereotype than it is to completely code nuance. And we know this as marketers because we use stereotypes to sell cat food and we use stereotypes to sell candy bars and we use stereotypes in our creation of market segments. Because at the end of the day, for marketers, it's not that much social harm. But if you're using a bunch of stereotypes based on existing societal standards from the last 50 years, you are creating junk data that will produce junk data. But if that junk data is being used to determine whether someone gets a license or someone gets arrested, then you've got a problem because you are the problem you are causing. So there's a lot of issues on machine learning. There's a massive societal problem here. As marketers, we should run like hell and we should not enable it. Also, um, one of my biggest frustrations in my professional life is that the parody of something is always going to end up being implemented. Uh, I have the phrase that I use that any sufficiently advanced dystopia is indistinguishable from someone else's utopia. If you read uh, any of the wonderful young adult utopia, oh, sorry, young adult dystopian fantasies, you know, the whole Hunger Games series, there was a bunch of people who read the Hunger Games and looked at Katniss and said, "Ooh, bad, bad person. Ooh, capital. Oh, I'd like to be them. Oh, I'd be them." The media, also the story of the Hunger Games, was that the big distracting thing was the love triangle. The real thing was the uprising. What did Hollywood focus on? They focused on the love triangle. Why? Because they saw themselves reflected in the capital. Any sufficiently advanced dystopia is someone else's utopia. When Robocop, the really terrible 2014 remake of the quite good uh, original Robocop parodies this whole idea of black box code of uh, an illusion of free will the system did it therefore 2014 we've had eight years of it being a socially acceptable idea that our oh, Excel did it robo debt in Australia uh, great example of oh it's not my fault it was Excel that did it it was an Excel file well shoot the Excel file, 
wipe the hard drive it was on, burn the master copies, and sack the person who was supposed to be managing it, supervising it, and keeping it in check. If a zoo has a bunch of animals go rogue and kill the people who are attending the zoo, I'm pretty certain the zookeeper doesn't get to go, ah, oh, mate, not my problem. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, mate. Sorry. Look, uh, I know the crocodile murdered your kid, but you know what? Not my problem. Also, you can't blame the crocodile. Crocodile's going to crocodile. In fact, it's your fault for having a child. What were you thinking, having a child putting near a dangerous animal like that? I mean, come on. That's the level of ridiculousness we're at with the code at the moment. We've got to, as marketers, we also need to, in organization, organizations we are in, turn around and say, hey, we own the outcome. It doesn't matter that the black box code came up with it on its own. We're the ones who then said, yes, green light, go ahead. And if we weren't the ones who said that, we're the ones who delegated our authority to say yes or no to a bunch of software. So we delegated the consequence of what that software does. And we then own that consequence. So it's like either we take direct ownership or we take responsibility. Uh, as I said, AI doesn't exist. It is bias under high speed. Humans are biased, myself included. You try and code me, and you try and code. As I've been writing these slides and doing these lectures, one of the things I've been very aware of is that I have an imaginary audience in my head. And sometimes when I was recording the assessment videos, I would react to last year's audience and I would say things that were preemptively defensively solving a problem that happened last year and I took most of those out because they weren't actually problems they were imaginary problems of garbage data they were me making an assumption about a way somebody could interpret something it wasn't based on a reality of the current now I recognized it was happening I was able to filter some of it not all of it whole chunk of it got through. If you are writing code that is doing what I was doing and you're not recognizing it and you're not filtering for it and you're not taking new data sets in and you're not using diverse data sets, then it's going to be a problem because it's a problem by design. It is a feature of the system that it will generate based on what you train it to generate on. What you teach it is what it's going to learn and it's going to apply literally. So if there is no if there is no zero point, so if you can have a fine that has a penalty attached to it, but you don't code into the software that at 0, 0.00, that is the paid off, that fine exists at 0 0.01, you'll have people with a fraction of a cent, 0 0.0001 of a cent, that cannot be paid because the system rounds it up. You cannot give them, you cannot pay off this debt, but the debt exists, so therefore you can be punished that error will make its way through the system. And you've got to code for that. You've got to code and take responsibility. You've got to have human manual override at the end. <sighs> Particularly marketing. We got to, engineering will get away with a whole bunch of stuff and blame us. So we might as well get down there with a baseball bat and say, hey, not on our watch, Sparky. All right, final thing on this. Uh, there's a paper on how to predict the future. Uh, Look, I predicted the future accidentally. I used Leximancer, uh, which is a undiscovered ontology software. It looks at a body of text and draws relationships between keywords. And back in 2006, I ran a Leximancer analysis of Wayne Swan, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Wayne Swan, Treasury speech, budget speech, and I came back and I said, look, this is uh, not 2006, after 2006, it was after Kevin Rudd had been elected. Uh, Swan was Deputy Premier, Deputy Prime Minister. And I ran this analysis of the speech. I said, look, this is a really weird thing. Um, I think there's a glitch in my software because every word in this connects to every other word except the word future is connected to everything else except Kevin Rudd. And the word Kevin Rudd is connected to everything else except the word future. And that makes no sense to me. 
They present this at a political marketing conference, and a few weeks later, Kevin Rudd gets rolled as leader of the Labour Party. And I'm sitting here going, oh, that is so awkward. I've used Lexi Monster to tell the future. Whoops. So first of all, Lexi Monster is a dangerous tool. Second of all is that you can use uh, mass, and this is a mass machine based learning machine identity. Also, it's really funny. Look at the date. When you pick this paper up and read the paper, look at the date of publication and look at the date of the movies involved. Time, time lags in this business is uh, phenomenal. But basically, your effective idea out of this is that you can pull out predictions from mass bodies of text. Uh, and it validates that conversational based experiential products will do better if the positive conversation is easier to initiate than the negative conversation, duh, zone of tolerance, but also positive engagement with the value offer means that the value offer is actually more important than the promotion. It has to have a relative advantage. So we loop the entire subject back around to relative advantage, which is where we started. And with that in review, it has been a semester. Thank you. I've recorded these in advance. I hope it's been a good one for you. I, at this point in time, am here and we are at this point in time there. So it has been and will be quite the honor. Cheers, mates. Thank you and good night. The official content for the semester is done. Ooh.